got in there, enjoyed a little soup and some sandwiches, and uh, got the got your bellies full. And so, hopefully, we got you fed physically, and now we'll work on the spiritual part. I'm, this wasn't in my Bible when I came in here, but it was. So I'm assuming someone left this up here and asked uh, if anyone lost an angel earring. It is a loose clip earring. So if you lost it, it's right up here. You can come and claim it. Well, I trust everyone had a good Christmas. Good. And we're, we're, we're going to have a wonderful new year. Amen. I don't know about you. I'm kind of excited about where God is taking me personally for the new year. And, uh, and hopefully us as a family and, and us as a church family. Uh, hopefully we'll all be heading in the same direction. And uh, I think God has great big plans for us. I, I told you all along, uh, I believe... Uh, just in, in my prayer time with him and some of the vision that he has showed me for this church, that he plans a great uh, cowboy and cowgirl awakening through this church. And I kind of snickered a little bit when that first kind of came to me uh, because I'm thinking, we're a cowboy church, but mostly in name. And uh, But but I will, I will tell you, God said, no. No, you just remember, this wasn't a cowboy church, and I led you here, and we'll finish there. And so I know he's got great things in store. But the first thing we have to know going into anything is, what's going on around us? Now, we're fixing to close out 2021. And, and 2021 had its own uniqueness 2020 started the COVID, COVID epidemic, and it continued on into 2021, and we had a rebirth of it. And uh, But all things being equal, pretty much just for a country, we've done pretty well. We've been pretty blessed. As a church, we've been highly blessed. But as a people, as a culture, as a nation, we've done fairly well in coming through this. Now, the loss of one life is always devastating, and as many as we lost, it's quite devastating. But in the big scheme of things, we've been pretty mm, fortunate or blessed. But we're going to say goodbye to 2021. We won't get a day of it back. We won't get an hour of it back. But we're going to go where we're going to get new days, new hours, new moments, new breaths, new life, and new opportunities. And the problem is, is most of us are still living two or three years ago. We're still living on things that's happened to us in our past, things that's happened uh, to us. Uh, we, we can't look to the future because we can't let go of the past. And, and God doesn't want us living in the past. You know, I... I <laughs> We laugh about it, Jordan and I, every time we watch The Lion King. Because if you remember, there's a, a portion in the, in the movie The Lion King which Rafiki the monkey slaps him in the head with his, with his stick and when he pops him in the head, he goes, what'd you do that for? He goes, it doesn't matter, it's in the past. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's the way God wants us to think about things. What's happened is behind us. We can't do anything about that. But what we can do is we can change things in the future. And so we, we've got to look to our future. Your rear view mirror is the smallest part. And your side mirrors are the smallest things on your vehicle. But your windshield is huge. There's a reason because you look forward through it. So you need to spend more time looking forward than backwards. Now, you, all that said, we have a mandate as a church. And we look around today and we go, wow, the world we live in, it's just, it's crazy. The world we live in, this, this is nuttier than any other time in man's history. I'm going to share something with you in just a few minutes. I'm going to ask you if you would bow your heads with me tonight. Let's open in prayer. Father, 
I thank you for this opportunity to study together. I thank you, Lord, for your blessings and your mercy, which maketh rich and addeth no sorrow. Father, I thank you today that we have this opportunity to just come together. Lord, and just study your word. Lord, I pray that you will open our hearts to receive, our minds to just interpret and break this down in our lives so that we may apply it in our walk with you. Lord, I pray your blessings over this night. Let everything said and done glorify you and lift up your kingdom. And these things we ask in Christ's name. And everybody said, Amen. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Romans. And we're going to be in chapter 1. Chapter 1 of Romans, and we're going to begin in verse 18. Now, Paul, when he wrote this letter, had never visited Rome. But he was talking of his desire to visit Rome and his reasoning for wanting to visit Rome. And so when he writes this, he writes this from a place of prayer and a place of vision because he's never been there. But God has set something in his heart that made him want to go there and share the gospel. Now, we as a church, we as a people group, uh, let's, let's change something between 2021 and 2022. I don't want to refer to us as Christians any longer. And you go, why? Because Christians get a bad rap. I want to refer to us as followers of Christ. Because that's what we should be. Christian by nature means that I'm Protestant or I, I seek another religion other than uh, Judaism, Catholicism, uh, pick something. Actually, I take that back. It means that I choose a religion other than Hindu, Buddhism, uh, Buddhism uh, other foreign religions, Muslim religion. I, I choose the, the Christian religion over all other religions. Just because I choose a religion doesn't make me a Christian. It doesn't make me a follower of Christ. I have to accept Him as my Lord and Savior and desire to follow Him long before I can become a follower of Christ. And so not everybody we bump into, that's where we struggle with church people because we all assume they're all Christians. And they are by the religion that they follow. But they're not all followers of Christ. So that makes a difference. So for just a moment, let's assume going into 2022, that we who are saved, have accepted Christ and are following Him, are followers of Christ or disciples. Fair enough? Okay. Yes, sir. To differentiate them from, yes, from those that, that were actually from Judaism at the time. Um, yeah, that, that's a true statement. And so, yeah, that's, uh, you don't want me calling you a bad name, do you? <laughs> I just want us to be followers of Christ. And I think everybody's good with that. So let's do this. Let's read on. Let's see where Paul's going. Since we're in Romans, let's see where Paul's going with this. He says in verse 18, for God, let me read it out of the New King James Version since that's what Mike's got up there first and then I want to cross-reference it into the CSB. All right. In 18 it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. 
Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of this world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness, in the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. They are worshipers, backbiters, excuse me, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, let's just stop there. We've got plenty to chew on for the rest of the night. 2021. Man, we are in a bad way. This was 57 AD. This was 57 AD. And it sounds like we're talking about, it sounds like the Fox News reporter just read this. It didn't matter in 57 A.D. or 2021. Vile, unrighteous, unsaved people are on this earth. And they need the message of Jesus Christ or they're going to die without it. That's, that's, That's the whole reason Paul wanted to go to Rome. To share the gospel. He wanted to be able to share with the Greek and the Jew alike. That Christ had come and died for your salvation. That you don't have to just. The Jews were always subject to the law. The Greeks not. Or the Gentile not. However. When Christ came, He made us all subject unto Him. So the Gentiles had nothing. Back in the day before before Christ came, the Gentiles had nothing. But the Jew always had the law. As long as he upheld the law, he could call himself a righteous person. But the Gentile had nothing until Jesus Christ came and made us all equal under Him. And so when he came and made us all equal under him, then guess what? We all had the ability to become righteous through Christ Jesus by accepting him as our Lord and our Savior. Now today, if we all have accepted him as our Lord and Savior, now we must make some more decisions. Not only do I now have him in my heart, now I can go into, I can go undercover. I can just go in a closet someplace and sit and, and likely I'm not going to get in any trouble. Or I can go back out in the world and go to work. 
go to school, go do all the, go to the grocery store, uh, hang out with my friends, go do all the things that I've got to do, and likely I'm going to bump into some sin. Or at least the temptation or the opportunity for it. That's what he's saying here. After a while, people just don't even think about Christ anymore. Anybody ever get so far away from him in your days when you were out in the world, you just got so far away from him, you didn't even give it a thought anymore? Yeah, most everybody can, can attest to that. I just got so far away from him, my heart grew cold. It grew like a, a stone. Everything just kind of hit and bounced off of it. I didn't think anything I was doing was so bad. I wasn't hurting anybody. I wasn't breaking any laws. Everybody was good. But you see, goodness doesn't equal righteousness. Only Christ can make me righteous. I mean, I can act out and make me good, but only Christ can make me righteous. So through him, now I, I've accepted my righteousness. Now I have a choice. Now I've got to decide, okay, am I going to follow Christ? Or am I going to follow the world? Am I going to follow my own decisions? Am I going to follow my religious beliefs? Now let me tell you something. This is going to make some of you real upset with me, and that's fine. You can come in my office and talk to me. But there is a huge difference between following Christ and following religion. Absolutely. A huge difference. Christ didn't set so many rules into place that you can't live. But we as man, in order to separate people out of the, out of the group, we got to have rules. And not just to separate people out of the group, but then so, so that we seem righteous. We have to do certain things so we can appear righteous. And those things don't make us any more righteous if we do them with the wrong heart or for the wrong reason. And so we have to be really careful that we don't get caught up in religion and trade that out. That's why I'm really careful about saying followers of Christ or disciples of Christ versus churchgoers or, or church people or Christians or whatever you want to call them. Whatever you would normally call yourself. Think of yourself now as a follower of Christ because you you got to... I've accepted him as my Lord and Savior. Now I'm either going to follow him or I'm going to follow other ways. I want you to think about that. Because so many times we don't think about it that way. You have a choice. I've accepted him as my Lord and Savior. Now I follow him or I follow everything else. And so many times we get up and we follow other things. We follow things that fit us fit the way we think or the way we believe or the way we think things should be. And Christ is going, hey, 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 I'm over here. Hey, this way. And you're going, but, 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 but wait, wait, wait. Because let me tell you something. Following Christ is not always comfortable. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Following Christ is not always comfortable. It's definitely not always popular. But the way of the world is always popular. And it's usually comfortable because that's what we were raised up in. That's what we're used to. That's what se- There's a way that seemeth right unto man. Well, that's the way of the world. Because that's all we see. So that seemeth right unto man. Oh, but Christ leading you over here, this is the way. He says, I am the way, the truth and the life. So if he tells you I'm the way, that means... He didn't say, I'm in the way. He said, I am the way. So we have to prepare and follow after him. And that's what he's trying to tell people here. These guys gave over to all sorts of stuff. They even made their own gods that they were prepared to worship. Gods that looked like men, that looked like animals, that, that, that looked like creatures. And it caused their minds to be skewed and start to do things that were unnatural. Which is what we see around us today. Lots of things that are unnatural. And so we just want to wash our hands of it and go, oh, that's all that trash out of the world. We don't have nothing. That's who we're supposed to be 
witnessing to. That's who we're supposed to be talking to. But we are scared to death of them. And I know why. Because that's where you get stuff on you. If you go fishing and you do it right, when you come home, you're going to smell like fish. If nothing else, you're going to smell like the lake or the river. Honestly. If you go out and you play uh, some game and you play it hard, you're going to come back and smell like sweat and grass and dirt and everything else, depending on what you played. So, yes, if you go and, and, and you're going to witness to people and you're going to minister to people, then guess what? You're probably going to smell and reek of that. But that's why you ask Christ. Before Long before you ever go there, you ask Christ to empower you, to cover you. He's your covering. He's the one that goes before you. I hear people all the time and they say this. Well, you know, I, I just don't want to turn my back on my friends. Don't turn your back on your friends. They may not be your best friends and they may not be the people you hang out with, but you don't turn your back on them because the only way they're going to know about Jesus is if you tell them. You got to share with them. Well, you know, I just feel like I've got to hang out. Man, don't feel obligated to anything. You're not obligated to stuff. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, the devil will come at your mind any way he can get you. If he can get you through fear and worry, he will. If he can get you through doubt, he will. If he can get you through temptation, he will. If he can talk your friends into bringing you down, he will. You must be ever vigilant as a follower of Christ to not let go of your spiritual walk with Him. Because there's people out there that the devil will use to bring you down. That's the truth. Some of them will go to church with you. Oh, really? Pre yes! I'm not on our church in particular. I'm talking about churches across the world. The church house is full of people who are religious but not saved. They're religious but not followers of Christ. And it's those same people that the devil says, yes, by all means, go to church because I've got a foot in the door if you're there. And so then... It allows him the opportunity to bring you down and to bring others down. So you must be ever vigilant in your walk with Christ. Now, these practices became commonplace among the men and women of that day. So much so that that was running rampant in the country. Well, guess what? It runs rampant in our country. If you ask people, they'll tell you that, that our country is full of Christian people. That's our problem. It's full of Christians. It's not full of followers of Christ. It's not full of disciples of Christ. It's full of Christians. And so we have to get used to understanding that that is just a, a misnomer to gather all the church people under. That's why so many of you struggled with going to church for as many years as you did because of all the Christians in the church who were doing the same thing you were doing on Friday and Saturday night and then coming into church and judging you on Sunday morning. Did y'all ever have anybody like that in your church? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's the hard thing. Because what it does is it takes people and it destroys them. So I'm suggesting that we do something uh, like Paul here. We begin to pray for people. Okay. Let's try this again. We're going to kick off 2022 by praying for our community. 
We're going to pray for Killeen. We're going to pray for Florence. We're going to pray for, for Georgetown, Lampasas, Slado, all the way around to Liberty Hill, Briggs. Keep going, Lampasas, Kempner, Coppers Cove. Uh, that's our surrounding communities. We're going to pray for them. Every one of them. If we have to, we'll get in groups and we'll call the city by name. And we'll pray for those cities. And we'll speak encouragement over those cities. And we'll ask God to give us inroads into those communities where we can minister the gospel to people. And then we will take advantage of every inroad we're given to minister the gospel to people. Show the love of Christ. In 2022, I hope this place fills to capacity and we have to think about another service simply because so many people have experienced the love of Christ in the people that go to church here and they've got to come. And you go, well, pastor, you're, you're, you're preaching awful hard at us and we're the core. Yes, you're the core of the church. That's why you're getting this message. You need this message as much or more than anybody else because you are the core. And if you are the core of your church, let me tell you something. You are the ones that have to be ever vigilant. Because who do you think Satan's going to come after even harder? The core. Now for everybody out there that's watching this, that didn't get to be here tonight, that don't make you not the core. I just don't want people worrying about that. There's a lot of people in this church that are core people in the church. And, and, and honestly, we have to protect what God has started here. This is a great work of God. and He will do the protecting, but He has sent us to be ever vigilant in overseeing it and protecting it and watching over it. So that, so that little cancer cells don't get in and destroy what God is trying to do. He's made you and I the protectors. He's made us to watch over, to pray for, to go forth. I mean, honestly, he didn't. He didn't tell the disciples, you know. Uh, he didn't give them the 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 <laughs> the great commission and say, "Go ye forth." Well, eh, I, hold on, hold on, guys. Never mind. Y'all don't go forth. Let me go before you and get all this started. He says, I've already started it. I've already prepared the way. I've already done the footwork. I've been doing it for years. You guys have been following me around. Guess what? I'm going to now go be with my Father. The Holy Spirit's going to come. He's going to empower you. And now you're going to go do what I've been doing. That's what it says. If you don't believe me, read your Bible. Read Acts start, and then roll over into Romans. Read those two. And that's where all the churches come from. They started rolling up from there. But that's what he said. He said, I've set a path for you. You know what your path is. Get on it. I've set a path for the church. You know what the path is. Get on it. Don't lollygag around. Get on it. Because the more you sit and wait, you lose a day. You lose two days. You lose a week. You could have ministered to two or three people in that week. Now let's just say for a moment. And two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen. Yeah, we're somewhere around thirty-five people in here, maybe forty. If every one of you ministered to one person every other day for just two days, or for four days, think about that. Think about your numbers. 40 people every other day, four days, that's 80 people because of every other day. Because I'll see a bunch of you looking at me like, you've got funny math. No, math's, math's right. That's 80 people. Plus you. Because you're already here. So you think about that. If you can just share the love of Christ every other day for two days or for four days, I'm sorry. 
You're like, yeah, that's what we're for. If you were able to do that, think about that. You would suddenly just, just immediately, if you were able to get them to say, you know what, I totally agree with you, the love of Christ, I'm coming to see where you go to church. Suddenly, there would be 120 people here. 80 plus you is 40. That's the way things build. Is that right? I see my wife laughing at me and my daughter laughing at me. That usually means oh, you've messed that up. <laughs> huh? Oh, y'all were watching me ad? I had to think. I'm not like y'all, I'm telling you. All the smarts is in the females in my family. <laughs> that sums it up because I'm the only male. So, so I guess we know who the dummy is, huh? Hey, the one thing I was smart enough to do was marry way above myself. Amen. In the words of Paul from Brandon, I outkicked my coverage. I just want you, I just want you to understand, ladies and gentlemen, the importance that God puts on you and I as his children. Not only does he love us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for us personally. So that we might be set free and delivered from the wages of our sin, which are death. Now we have victory over death, hell, and the grave. We have freedom. We have joy. We have peace. We have love. We have... Man, you, when you start unfolding all the gifts that God has given you, it is amazing. And then he says, okay, I'm going to take Jesus back because he's done what I've asked him to do. I'm going to place him at my right hand where he can make intercession for you. But this is where he's going to be. So I'm going to send somebody for you. I hadn't forgot you. I haven't left you out. I'm now going to send the Holy Spirit, the Helper. And he's going to lead you into all righteousness. He's going to guide you into truths. He's going to lead the way for you. And if you will follow the Spirit of the Most High God, whom I'm sending to you, you can't go wrong. It has been tested throughout time. When people follow God, He makes the difference. When people follow their own logic, their own thoughts, there's a lots of mistakes. Now, if you look around us, you would say the world in which we live today is better than it's ever been. As far as technology goes, as far as automobiles go, and I would tell you, you are absolutely wrong. Every automobile out there just about has some kind of recall on it. Honestly, there's a class action suit. I drive a Chevrolet Silverado. There's a class action suit right now against Chevrolet because they knew the lifters were bad in the trucks. And the Silverados, the Camaros, and there's one other. I don't remember what the other one was. I knew the lifters were bad. I've had 26,000 miles on that truck, and it's been in the shop twice, and lifters on both sides replaced. Now, <laughs> everything out there is not the way it used to be. But we're far more advanced than ever. Know what we are is we have taken things and we've improved our time. Now you can pop a dinner in the microwave and in four minutes you can have dinner. It used to take my mom 40 minutes to an hour and 40 minutes to throw dinner together. Now you can have it in four minutes. Guess what? It used to be a Saturday afternoon. You changed the oil in all the vehicles. Now... You drive them up to the 15-minute oil change place and they all get changed. <laughs> Do what? I heard somebody say something. Where's that? Where's that? Yeah. Yeah, the funny thing is, is, is I've not been to one yet. There's one that says take five, five-minute oil change. You'll sit in line for four hours to get to the five-minute oil change, which takes 25 minutes. I'll never forget. I rode, I rode through there with Ashley. Or Jordan, I'm sorry. We went through there and and I looked over and I said, we ain't coming ever again, ever. <laughs> it's terrible. 
Because you can go to any oil change place over here. Go, go over to North Killeen late in the afternoon or early on a Saturday and it's empty. You can drive right into one of them Valvoline places and get it done. Ten minutes you're in and out gone. But now I saved that whole Saturday. So all these time saving things that man has come up with, but yet I have less time than I've ever had. I want you to think about that a minute. I know less about my family today with all these time-saving apparatuses and gadgets and everything else. I know less about my family today than I did 20 years ago when somebody was cooking for hours and somebody didn't get home from work till 5.30 or 6. And you go, well, why is that? Well, because when they got home at 5.30 or 6, dinner was ready. We'd sit down and eat at the table and we'd talk. We'd interchange. And you go, well, you can still do that. You can, but we don't because we got all this time. But yet we're time starved. Let me tell you something, folks. When God created time, we didn't figure out how to use it any better or worse than than it, was, than it was when he created. What we've done is we've tried to make everything so efficient that we've become inefficient. We've tried to make everything so timely that we've lost time. And we've crowded in things that we don't even need to take up our time. And sometimes we just need to get back to being you and I. Here, I'm gonna, I got just a few minutes. I'm going to take you down some old roads here. How many of you remember eating watermelon on the front porch when you was a kid? Yeah, we'd take that thing out on the front porch, cut that joker open, and there'd be 20 people with spoons, but we just had two halves. We didn't cut them things. You walk over, you get you some, you take a bite, you back off so everybody else can walk up there and get some. We ate till we were full, drippings everywhere, seeds everywhere. One kid... Got one watermelon half. The other kid got the other and took them to the trash. The other kid got the water hose. And we sprayed off everything. <laughs> Usually. That's what we got in trouble for. though. <laughs> but at the end of the day, we had time. We sat and visited and, and, and ate and did that. And big discussions were salt or no salt. So, how many of you remember having the old, oh, I forget about this thing, excuse me, back up, there we go. How many of you remember the old Turner ice cream? Yeah, I sat on my grandmother's porch and nobody needed to sit on it. But my grandmother said, one of you sit here, the other one, crank. And the other one is in charge of ice and rock salt. When it gets low, you stand up, you fill it with ice, pour rock salt on it, you put the towel on it and set back down. And when you get tired, everybody change. Yes, and the kid who was doing rock salt and ice would stick their finger in the hole on the side where it drained. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it probably took 20 minutes, 30 minutes to sit there and churn that. I don't remember exactly. It seemed like forever when we were kids. Guess what? My mom and dad bought an electric one. It did it itself. Now kids had time to tear the house apart. But nobody even talked. You came in, they scooped you a bowl, and away you went. Back then, guess what? Some of our fondest times, and probably yours too, was cranking that, getting the treat for all the work you did. Yeah, that was the fun part. But guess what? We created something that makes it faster and easier now we got more time. <laughs> there you have it. Bluebell took the electric ice cream freezer right out of service. Honestly, Bluebell is wonderful, it is. But I want to tell you, for all the time we save, what do we do with it? 
What do we do with it? We're the least rested society ever. Least rested. Because we don't take vacations like we did then. We don't get away like we did then. We feel our, you know, most people work Monday through Friday. Some work Monday through Saturday. If you were a rancher or farmer, you, you seem like you worked all the time. But let's just for a moment. For those that work five days a week, on Saturday, usually in the morning they got up and did all the lawn work. They caught up the house, the lawn work, the laundry, whatever. And by noon they were done. And they would go do whatever they wanted to do as a family. And then on Sunday, we all went to church. And we had lunch. Usually as a family, so we always ate back in the day at the Holiday Terrace in Colleen, Texas. The Blue Moon Cafe. For those of you who have been around here a long time. We met as a family and that's where we had lunch. Even my wife and myself met my grandfather for years after we got married. We would go meet him after church at a little place called Grandy's right there by his church. And we'd either have chicken or a chicken fried steak. But we had moments as a family together and time spent with my grandfather. And you probably have those same experiences like that. But And, and then we would go home and rest on Sunday afternoons. And then we would, in the evenings, get ready to go to church again. Well, we can't even fathom that because people don't want to go to church on Sunday night because i got too many things to do. We went to church. And if you stayed with my grandparents, you went to church, singing, training union, church. Yeah, that was a day. Woo! You'd have to go, you'd have to, go to a full gospel church for a couple of weeks to get over that much church in one day. But seriously, it, it, was, it was part of our fabric. And we were more rested. But now we cram the kids' ball games and everything else into Saturday. And we've already crammed four practices into the week. And, and if they don't have a, you know, a travel, and we, we, we may travel all weekend uh, to San Antonio, Dallas, Houston, wherever, and, and, and watch games all day. And, and we love being with our children. But we find ourselves traveling home late on a Sunday wore smooth out from all the running and everything else we've done. And then we come sliding in sideways and get up early on Monday to go back to work. And they can't figure out why we're wore out. Where did you stop? God never meant for us to live like that. He meant for us to live righteous, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. He meant for us to live rested. He meant for us to have joy. And let me tell you something. When you're not rested, guess what you don't have? Joy. Anybody ever meet that person at work on Monday? You are that person. All right. Okay. <laughs> Seriously, though, think about that a minute. You meet that person. Why is that person like that? He's not a morning person. I hate this. Well, just I got to get to my coffee first. That coffee don't have nothing to do with making you happy. No. You just think it does. There's, there's nothing proven in coffee. The stimulation might pick you up, but it can't make you happy. It's a choice. Now, when you get that, it's like, hey, y'all really want to go someplace? I'm fixing to get in trouble. Let's just go with smokers for a minute. Not picking on him. Not picking on him. My daddy was a smoker till the day he died. But I just want to share something with you. There's not one thing in a cigarette that makes you relax. Think about it. What do you do when you smoke? What do you do in an ambulance when you're in such pain and the guy goes, hey, look at me. Breathe deep. Take deep breaths in, slow deep breaths out. That's what you do when you smoke. Only difference is you take in poison at the same time, which is becomes addictive. Smoking don't make you happy. It makes you addicted. 
Slow, long breathing makes you happy. So I'll tell you what. If you're a smoker in here, I want to help you with something. Next time you're feeling a little beside yourself, go out on the back patio and go. And do that six or eight times. And I guarantee you, you'll get the same result. You'll get the same result breathing wise for calming. What you won't get is you won't get the sensation of the nicotine. That's the only difference. Promise you. People who live on caffeine, go without it for three days. Now you will have one tremendous headache. I, <laughs> if you can make it three days without burning your house down, the, it, it's proven that the stimulant of the caffeine might still be good after the next six or seven months. It's going to save time. Our bubble coffee is wonderful. It is. But the stimulant will go away in three days. Yes, sir. It'll go away in three days. Believe it or not, for those that smoke and those that drink it, in three days, the stimulation of the nicotine is gone. Then it becomes a habit. Yes, sir. That's the truth. I'm, I'm sharing scientific truth with you right now. And I'm doing that for a reason. I'm just Telling you know that it's the habits that have to be broken with us. And let me tell you something. I don't know about you, but I'm not a happy person. You probably aren't me. Jesus Christ is a happy person. He's the one that comes to deliver you. He can deliver you from all sorts of things. He's the one that changes a man and woman's life. He's the one that makes us who we are. He's the one that made us to be who we're supposed to be. The funny thing is, is it, it, now I'm going to reward you for listening to all my stuff all night. He made you to be special. He made you for greatness. God did not make one of your children to be ordinary or average. I'm telling you now. He did not make you to be ordinary or average. Some of you want to settle it average that you like it that I'm comfortable just being average. But he did not make you be average. He made you be great. He made God made his children for greatness. Look all through the Bible. That's all you need to die. Tell me. If you read about them and you know who they are, they're not average. Because average gets lost in the crowd. He made you for greatness. He made you to follow him into greatness. To be all that you can be. To do all that he's asked of you to do. For you to do what he has set you on the path to do, you must be great. Because tell me, how are you going to minister to all the people he's asked you to minister to if you don't have the greatness? Now, here's the, here's, the, here's the issue. Most of us look at ourselves and say, I can't be great because of you fill in the blank. Myself. Myself. Don't you know nothing that has to do with it, but you really make fun. I can't be great because, well, I can't be great because, you know, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't born into a great family. I wasn't born into riches. I, I was born into poverty. I was born into this. I was born into... Ah, that's, that's all excuses. There's people that were born into poverty that have done great things. There's people that were born into, into just average families that have went on and done great things. Well, I, I, I never was able to get a college education. There's people that were not able to get a college education that got one. Let me tell you, you have to set aside the excuses so that you can do the great things. Well, you know, I, Christ empowers you to set aside those things that you may be great. You may not want to be, but it ain't because he didn't make you to be. So please understand that. People tell you 
all the time. You're beautiful and wonderfully made. Absolutely. That's part of your grace. But you have to accept that and walk in it. Otherwise, you will always hold yourself back. When Christ is going, I mean, Christ is not going to pull you to the gate of heaven going, God, God, you got this shit, God. And you're going to hold yourself back. So if he turns down, looks over his shoulder, says, come on. Go. Go. Come on, my child. Go you. Come on. If he whispers in your ear, says, hey, do it this way. Hey, do it that way. Has any of you ever watched Tom Hayden? He actually has a, uh, kind of a little Bible study he does. He has to come down to see in which Elijah had witnessed an earthquake, a fire, or something like that. Earthquake, fire, or something like that. Anyway, if you read it in uh, Second Peter, uh, you'll learn about it. But in any case, he went out on the mountain and he clothed himself and went on the mountain to listen. And in the earthquake, he heard no voice. In the fire, he heard no voice. And then there was something else, and he heard no voice. And then finally, he heard after that a still small voice. And the still small voice said, What are you doing here? Ask one question What are you doing here? And, to, and you know what he does? He starts telling the Lord, instead of what I'm doing here, he starts telling him all the things that are wrong. And everything that needs to happen. And the Lord said, Wait a minute. This is what I want for you. And he specifically told me. <laughs> I believe if you look at 12 and 18, there's actually two people looking at the Bible. I believe it's 2 Peter 12 and 18 is where it starts. But he asked him a specific question. And he gave him the answer he wanted to give him, not the answer he asked. Or not, or not what he's asking about. That's what we do so many times with God. He looks at us and says, I want you to do this. And we go, I can't do this, but I can do this. <laughs> no, that's not what I asked you to do. I asked you to do this. Hey, I want you to go do such and such. I can't do that. But I tell you what, this is what I can do. God doesn't want what you can do. He wants what I told you to do. Because I've empowered you to do what I told you to do. Listen to me, and I'll get right here. God doesn't want you to do what you want to do. That's what you empowered yourself to do. He wants you to do what he's asked you to do, because that's what he's empowered you to do. And everybody goes, but this is not open to us. You don't have the ability to argue with God. You can but you don't, you're not going to win. You can't argue with God over what he asks of you. Because you will lose. I am living, breathing, walking proof standing in front of you that you can turn your back on what God has asked you to do for years and years and years and go through everything you want to do. And eventually, if you ever want to be happy, you will give in to what God has asked you to do. Period. So here, let me save you 40 years of unhappiness. When you know what he's called you to do, what he's asking of you, just do it. And watch how the things, well, I just, I, I, didn't, I didn't have the money to go to school. Well, we did. <clears throat> I didn't have the time. I was at a full-time job. We had children. I didn't have the time, but we did. My wife was a single parent some of the time. Because it was not unheard of to go to school and be in study hall down there until 10, 11 o'clock at night. My oldest daughter was a cheerleader in Bowman Middle School. Woohoo! I'd stop by there right after work and I'd watch her cheer for about maybe a half if I was lucky, and then I'd go to school. And then I would see them when they were in bed. But I can 
tell you, in that moment, I seriously was questioning, God, are you sure? But everything fell into place. I always seem to have time. I always seem to have the money when it was time to make a payment. Everything seems to just fall right in place. And you do when you look at each other because they don't look at you and go, we know we're blessed. We know this is what's supposed to happen. And we know we're blessed to be here. And we know we're blessed to be pastors here. Because it didn't come easy. I was convinced because God had called me before he told my wife that's what we're doing. It took her several more weeks, maybe even a month or so. It took us a while before God spoke it into her spirit. Because she was still struggling with the whole idea of being a pastor's wife. That was bad enough. So I know we're right where we're supposed to be. Doing exactly what God has called us to do. And I, I'll tell you how I know that. Because as long as I do things that's popular with Christ, He will continue to sustain and drive us and take us and lead us into all righteousness. He will give us favor when we come. We just come out of a year which we shouldn't have seen this pain for. But God showed us favor financially. He showed us favor numbers and just people coming to church, bodies. He showed us favor in very few people in our church getting sick from each other. He showed us great favor. And even when we were having to go to line, because we didn't even have the, we have to do this the hard way. But he showed us great favor. That's how you know when you align with God's will is when things just happen and it seems like they just happen. They're not just happening. God's aligned everything to fall right in place. If you don't believe me, ask Noah. Ask Moses. Ask Job. God didn't build them a bridge over the Red Sea. He parted it. And when they were done, because guess what? He called them out of Egypt. He didn't call Pharaoh's army. He called them out of Egypt. He parted the Red Sea. They went across. What did he do? He found the Pharaoh's men in the Red Sea. See, they weren't supposed to cross the Red Sea. But his children were. You gotta know your call. When you call, go do it. And he won't make a way. Any questions, any comments? Very good. Absolutely. That's an absolute truth right there. I, I, I shared with somebody the other day, thank you for that. I shared with somebody the other day that was setting him off. If you want your if you expect your daughter to find a husband, you model what you want that man to look like. If you expect your son to find a wife, mother, model what that wife should look like. Because that's what they're gonna look for. That's the truth. So model it. You know what? If you want your children to if you want your children to act a certain way as a man or woman, then model it. Because they're going to act out what they see. Not what you tell them, not what you direct them, but what they see. So people outside the church are looking for as well. That's exactly right. They look at the children of the Lord and see how the Lord's children act. And guess what? That's on us. Because God told us what to do. And I promise you, Jesus has spanked our backside more than enough. Well, I'm guessing that Romans is kind of like Bell County now. <laughs> Romans? Well, 
not just Bill County, it, 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 the, 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 the world in general. Just the world in general. I don't know. That you, something wrong with the Bell County, but, but the world in general. Just kind of the way the world is today. If you, if you just took a synopsis of the world today and if you read it back right there, they, they would almost match.